have your Bibles and want to follow along, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. But because he has come, that we have hope, we have a life, we have, indeed, we have a future. Um, last night we had a children's play. It, the kids did a great job. They put in a lot of work. Um, it, it is a lot of work for, on various, just so many different ways, learning the songs, um, learning the lines. For some of the kids, they start off very, very, very shy, and by the time of the production, they're able to proclaim their, their lines loudly. Uh, but, but the whole, all of that, you have the theme of the the children's performance last night was a king is coming to town. Now, for those of you who are there, you, you know what was happening. But the story of the kids' play was all of the citizens of the town heard a king was coming, and it was the intent of two small children to draw attention to the fact that Jesus had come as the king. But the citizens of, of the small town of Rumors Mill are confused and are looking for all sorts of different kings. They have different misconceptions. And even though it's a, a silly little story to proclaim a truth, that, that is what happens today, isn't it? All around, that people have so many misconceptions about who the king is, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the only true God who has entered, who has entered his own creation as the man Jesus Christ in order to save us. And even when he was born, there were so many misconceptions. People were looking for a deliverer like Moses, a conqueror like Joshua, a king like David. And that, that's, not, that's not how he came that first time. Now, make no mistake, he is a deliverer like Moses and a conqueror like Joshua and a king like David. But it wasn't that they were wrong in what they were looking for. It's that they thought too small. He was so much more than they were looking for. He was also the humble servant who was a lamb, who was a sacrifice for our sins, and who was not, did not consider it beneath himself, even though he is God Almighty, to draw us into his presence so that he might be able to call us friends and brothers and sisters. Now, it's not that they thought the wrong things about God. They thought too small things about who the Messiah should be. So we're going to look this morning at a passage here, a couple passages really, um, but we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. And so if you want to turn there this morning together, we're going to look at the time primarily when Mary, after receiving the announcement from the angel, travels to see her relative Elizabeth. But before that, we'll need a little bit of context, right? Mary is going about her daily life. You remember the story. This isn't a new story. We do it every year, <laughs> just in case. Now, if you're here for the first time, we're, hap we're happy, happy to introduce it to you. But even in our culture, most people understand that there was Mary, and there she is one day, and the angel Gabriel appears to her, and he gives her a, a very shocking announcement, and that announcement is, you're going to have a child. And she says, how is this possible? Because I, I've, I've not been with a man. I'm not married. In fact, I'm only engaged. And he says, no, what is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. This is the fulfillment of what was told in Scripture. This was a fulfillment of, uh, of a lot of prophecies. But if we look here up on, on, the, on the screen as well in the book of Luke, we see the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and will bring forth a son and shall call his name 
Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. He, he, was, he was, he is the king. This was a fulfillment, I started to say, of the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This was a fulfillment of many prophecies. We've done whole sermons on just all the prophecies about who Jesus was and the statistical impossibility that one person could fulfill all those, either on purpose or on accident or in some combination of the two, that he was who was foretold from the very beginning, all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis, where we have been in Genesis chapter 3, mankind who was created to be with God, chosen sin in Instead, to rebel against God, to bring guilt upon themselves, to bring separation upon themselves. And into this sorry state, God speaks a promise of the seed of the woman which would come. It didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense back then, that promise. People didn't have all the information. This prophecy that we just read in Isaiah wasn't as clear until now they have context. And that context is Jesus Christ. That God became incarnate to deal with human sin, to reconcile you and I to him. There is no longer need be any separation because as we look forward to this child's life, we know that he grew and he became a man and he went to the cross, which we'll talk even more about that aspect next week. But in order that you and I could have the relationship with God that we were created for, forgiven from sins, pardoned from judgment, and to live with him and to enjoy him forever. It's great news. Mary gets this news. She doesn't have all of that in perspective yet. You can only imagine what it would be like as a young woman getting this news. You're going to have a child. There's no father. Don't worry. It's from God. Can you ma imagine sharing that with your parents? or your neighbors, or your friends. It sounded a little bit crazy. But the angel told her, and Mary believed. And the angel also told her that her relative Elizabeth was also with child. Now Mary's conception was a miraculous thing, being that she had no relationships with a man, and the child is conceived of the Holy Spirit, as in, and is in fact God in flesh. The eternal God, the second person of the Trinity, uniting himself with his creation... By being born into it is the child Jesus. And, and by the way, we probably should just mention here, he didn't surrender his divinity, although it was muted in its expression. As he set aside that usage of his divine abilities, living in obedience as a perfect man. That's a whole, whole nother sermon. But it's important to know Jesus was more than just a holy prophesied wise man. He was God in the flesh. Fully God, fully man. But Elizabeth, now her, her conception was miraculous as well. Not, not for the same reasons, not for his vaunted of reasons, but because her conception, and not because her conception came about in a supernatural way, but because the child had been set apart for special purposes, had been predicted by God, had been consecrated by God, and because Elizabeth was well past the age when she should have been having children. This, was, this is why her husband was so surprised when he got the announcement, for those of you who know that part of the story. The angel said, your wife Elizabeth's going to have a, a son. And his response isn't, this is great news. His response was, how can this be? Because she is very old. And I am very old. But God brought about the birth of their son, John, and who would become the forerunner, the one who would prepare the people for the coming Messiah. And so with all this news for, uh, for Mary, she goes and she visits Elizabeth. And we'll pick up here in verse 39. 
It says, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped inside her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Can, can you just imagine what it must have been like? Here's Elizabeth going around her duties, and now Mary comes, and the moment she hears Mary's voice, her child leaps with inside her. It's, it's, not, just, it's not just a kick. It's not just indigestion. It's not like most mothers thinking their baby is the smartest, most beautiful child that's ever existed. But this is, this is from God, and John has been set aside. And John, even before he was born, is responding to the nearness of the Messiah, who he has come to foretell. The first person to recognize him, even without seeing him, just to know he's there, is this unborn child that God has sent to Zechariah, to Elizabeth. And then the Holy Spirit speaks through her, and in a lot of ways paralleling the ministry that John would have, what he says, what she says about the Messiah, about his role to be, about John's role to be the forerunner for Jesus. Now Elizabeth does that in small part. Her personal praise, as we look, isn't about her own son. It would be really, really appropriate, right? Here, you've never been able to have a child. I know, I know there are families in here who have struggled with that. It's a hard thing. When the one thing that you want, you can't have, and you look around and everyone else can have and you cannot. And she's already made her peace with this, whatever, whatever level of peace she has. She's at least come to accept it. And then in her old age, God gives her this child, and her response is, he's taken away my disgrace. She's ecstatic. This is everything that she has wanted. But when, when Mary comes with Jesus, her praise is not that she has a child, but rather of the child which has come. Because as great as our children are, without Jesus coming, all of us, you and me and our kids, would be lost in sin and separated from God forever. This is the child who makes it right for everyone. And she praises, she's overwhelmed by the fact she's in the presence of the child for whom the entire world has been waiting. It's the Messiah, the Redeemer who will reconcile mankind to God. Now, I, I don't necessarily think she had the entire scope of Jesus' ministry in mind, but the Holy Spirit is revealing to her powerfully that God is accomplishing what he has promised from the beginning. And as we think back, as we've already said, the world was good. We were created in the image of God for a relationship with God. But then because of the fall, there was separation, there was guilt and spiritual death and corruption on humanity, distorting what was good, leaving us both lost and helpless and so much worse than we should have been. But God has called people out of the darkness along the way to say, look, I've not abandoned you to your sorry state, but I will redeem you, and I will show evidence of that and speak the truth of that and call you to follow me for that day when that redemption will occur. That he was, he was giving witness to the light that he was, but now that light had indeed entered the world. And we read this in John chapter 1. So we'll pause out of, out of Luke and read. Because this text speaks to the light which is coming into the world, which now Elizabeth is seeing, not, not in a visible manifestation, but feeling that in this dark world, suddenly there is light. 
And we read in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So this is, John chapter 1 is what is beginning here. Obviously, John has not been born and grown up and become the one proclaiming in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That hasn't happened yet. Jesus has not been born yet. He has not yet been attended by shepherds and proclaimed by a star and visited by magi and all of the other miraculous occurrences of his, of his birth, which would, of course, develop into a life which was remarkable even to those who did not know who he was. But in this moment, it's like the prelude to the, the, the full story, and Mary and Elizabeth have early information about what is happening. And then we see Mary has a song, which we call the Magnificat, of praise and acknowledgement of what God is doing. In verse 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. And behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on all who fear him. From generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And then Mary remained with her, that's Elizabeth, for about three months. And returned to her home. There, there's a lot we could go through in, in Mary's song, also, also informed by the Holy Spirit, the truths that are there. It speaks a lot about who Mary was, because when God speaks through people, it's not just like we're, it's not usually in Scripture. There are a few instances, I will, I will say that, but it's not usually like we're just a hollow tube that God speaks through. It's not like the telephone game. Like some of, you may, some of you may have had that really old school A-frame swing set. Remember those things? And, and when the plastic ends came off, you could stand on the little cross piece and stand up there and you could talk to each other back and forth. Um, like, hey, how are you? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> well, if you, weren't, if you weren't awake now, you, you weren't awake before you are now. True story, which is totally squirrel um i was doing that when i was four years old and i just like the sound hear the sound of my voice who wouldn't know that i would have been a pastor but um i like to hear that echo 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 so i get up there put my mouth on the end and go ah! uh, some bees were building a hive inside of that <laughs> yeah that, that was fun that was good times um so what happens when you insert an illustration that you didn't intend to say you just don't know where it's going. This is why you should be really thankful when I have a stick thack of, stack of notes. Randy, that's your job. You know that. Just make sure. Thanks. But Mary, 
she knew the Old Testament. This, this was, God has his reasons, and he doesn't always tell us, and he chooses the foolish things, the weak things, the things which aren't, to, to humble those who are. But Mary knew her Bible. She was looking forward to the, the Messiah. Everything in this psalm, not only is she very poetically gifted, but it speaks of all the promises of the Old Testament. It talks about the mighty one. It's, it's the, the name of God, El Shaddai. That his name is holy, generation after generation. Re- referencing the faithfulness, the consistent character of God toward those who believe. Of course, it says, to those who fear him. When we know the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and that means we are in proper relationship to God. Yes, sometimes we get really confused, if we're honest, because Jesus came as a man in a means that we can understand, because he is not ashamed to call us brothers and to welcome us as sons and daughters. Sometimes we get a little bit too familiar. Do you ever have that, parents, with your kids? You try and be a good buddy, but sometimes they just kind of think they're your equal in positional authority. And you're like, we're going to have to clip your wings just a little bit. Sometimes we, we do that in our relationship with the Almighty. It's pretty easy to have perspective. If you go out alone on a day in the stillness of creation, whether to look at the mountains or stand knee-deep in the ocean and look at the horizon, or to look at the stars at night and consider that God brought every one of these out by name, one by one, and spoke them into existence. So whenever we start to think a little bit too familiar with God, we need to stop and say there's, there's a healthy fear, a respect, that we need to make sure that we understand. And it is when we view ourselves in proper relationship toward God that the pieces come back together. His mercy is for those who fear him, who humbly come to him. He's done mighty things. Jesus is the the action of the Father's plan made flesh. He is the true and promised king, the ruler who will reign forever, who will wield justice, who will show mercy. And now he has come. He's the ones who the prophets foretold. We already read this, but it's in relationship now in the middle of the sermon. I want to read it again, uh, the scripture reading this morning. Remember Isaiah chapter 9, speaking of him? It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So many times at Christmas, we think of Jesus as a baby. And that's appropriate because he he was born as a baby. He was was born helpless, setting aside the use of his abilities. What a a curious thing. Small, held in his mother's arm in in his first birthplace in in that stable. But he was always and always is more than just a baby. And we err when we today leave him in the manger. And this, this Christmas, I hope you don't leave him in the manger in your heads and in your hearts. Because we fail when we do that to realize the fullness of all who he is. Because the same baby who was laid upon straw next to the cattle is the one who sits on the throne today with the angels encircling him in glory before the four living creatures who worship him forever and ever and cast their crowns, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. This, this is Jesus. And we need both pictures in our head. We need, we need the, the child made flesh who came for us. But not to set that aside, or neither to lose the image that he is the God of all eternity, from eternity past to eternity future, but who has now come to dwell with men. Now, the nation did not understand this. We have a hard time understanding this with the completeness of Scripture. That the king, the eternal king, God, the only God, came to serve creation by being a sacrifice to sin first, by redeeming wayward humanity so that he would, in fact, have subjects to rule over. He would have friends and brothers instead of enemies and criminals as Jesus came to save, and we'll, we'll bleed into that next week in the sermon. But the king who is more than the baby is also more than the savior. He's also the king of creation. Humble, and merciful, but the king nonetheless. And so much of Mary's song reflects this understanding of the greatness of the Messiah and his rule. And it's, it's not because she didn't understand. She wasn't mistaken in her song, but the realization of Jesus as a lamb isn't really a part of her, of her song. It skips over that part. That had not yet been revealed. She goes to the end, to the triumph of the Messiah, and we know that he would first have to suffer as the servant to save us from our sins. Sadly, the nation missed out on this because they did not understand this and were unwilling to change their minds to have them expanded for this truth. They, they, they did not understand. They could not stand before a Messiah who vanquished his enemies because they thought they were his people. And in a sense, they were, but they were still bound by their own sins. Unless God atoned for their sins, none could stand before him. Not the Jews, not the Gentiles, not the most righteous who walked among us. For all of us, the Bible says, have fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus came first to reconcile mankind to himself. And sadly, the people in their error of thinking and unable to adjust their beliefs as they were revealed from God to be in error, in the pridefulness of their own heart, so many miss that. They didn't understand he would first come humbly first to pay for sins before he came to judge unrighteousness. But make no mistake, even though Christ came as that humble servant first, those promises and those proclamations of Mary and all of Scripture have not been forgotten. Sometimes we sit around and go, Jesus has saved us, but what has he saved us for? The world is still broken. People still hate. Even Christians are still petty. We have no idea what's going on. Where, where is this coming kingdom? We, we echo the voices of Peter. who has been promised since the beginning. And our only hope and consolation are those who have already passed. And you're like, you, you, in faith, we say, well, thou, they are now experiencing what we are only hoping for. But the day will come when it will not only be those who cease to live on this earth, but also those who dwell on this earth, when the king will return and accomplish the rest of the story. Because the promises are not forgotten, delayed by our vantage point, for sure. But Christ has come, and he is coming again. And it is our job to speak to the world of this awesome truth that all men will meet him in this life or the next. And we want them to meet them, him as, as friends, as subjects, as those who are under his mercy. And whether we see that day or are gathered to him, we will indeed see our Savior face to face. But it's, um, as we said, we're not, last week, we're not only looking backward, we're looking forward. Our faith is more than a remembrance, it's a hope with expectation. We see this in Scripture in Titus 2.13. It says, We look forward for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious... That's the same verse. That's not 2 Timothy 4a. I do make my own PowerPoints. Thank you. 
because we're wrapping up, I'll let you turn there and read that one. This is your, your go home assignment. All right. I should have just turned there because now I'm just pausing to collect my thoughts anyway. But we're going on. But God became a baby who grew up to be our Savior. The Savior conquered death and hell, and he ascended alive into heaven. And he's returning. And the expectation of Mary will be a reality. And that's something we, we, we should long for. Because in that day... The injustices of this world will finally be put to rest. We will finally have a government that is righteousness, that lives, in, that rules in righteousness and wisdom. And God will be with, with men. So many of our Christmas carols remind us of this. I, I know I bring, I've brought this out before, and I hope you realize it. They, they talk about Christ being born, but they also talk about his sure return and his promised um, coming again. And, and I hope, as we sing those, that we too long for the Lord's appearing and love the Lord's appearing. Do we, do we actually rejoice in the thought that he could come at any time? Are we like Elizabeth, who when the Savior showed up at her doorstep, was overjoyed and humbled at the coming of the Lord to her doorstep? And if you don't know him, my encouragement to you is that you would know him. Because human beings were created for that relationship with God. And we do long for him, even if we don't acknowledge it. We were created for that relationship with God. Without it, there is a hole inside of our hearts that is in desperate need of fulfilling. And we try to fill it in all sorts of ways, but there is nothing that can fill the place that was designed for God himself to dwell. And it's a good place. He is good and he is just, he is kind, and he loves us. He loves you. He loved each of us enough to die for us that we might be restored to him so we could enjoy his goodness forever. Complete goodness, not just partial goodness like we experience in this life, but all of his love and mercy forever. And so if you don't know him, then obviously there is no reason to long for his appearing. Because you are, in fact, separated from him. From the love of God by your sins. It's an unnecessary separation because he paid the price in order to, to bridge that gap. We've already read, when we went to John for just a minute, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The door is open for any who would believe that Jesus died for their sins. That that alone brings us redemption, forgiveness, and a relationship with God. And that he rose from the dead. And that for those of us who say, on that alone I will put my trust that I might have reconciliation with God. The Bible makes it clear that God will welcome us as his sons and daughters. He will welcome us home. There is no other way. But Jesus did what only he could do. As we read in scripture that, that he came to atone for us because of his mighty love. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. So we have a lot to rejoice at this Christmas. We have to rejoice that he has come, that he loves us. We, have a, we, have, we can rejoice that we see him and we can comprehend him in, a, in an aspect which we never could before without seeing Jesus. We, of course, should celebrate that he has reconciled mankind to God for any who would put their faith in what he has accomplished on the cross. And that we long for and anticipate and celebrate that he is indeed coming again. We're song here, which, you know, we might just be singing. I don't know if you've caught this before. I, I, I remember when I first really realized that joy to the world is indeed about the fact that Christ has come. But you really see how much, like Mary's song, it's looking forward to what is coming. 
that no more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteous love. And we'll go on to sing the rest. I, I, didn't print, I did print it all. But if you look, it's like in really, really tiny font. And I'm not going to try and read it. <laughs> you know what? We have so much to sing and celebrate. Whether you're with us or not next week, um, I hope you set aside the time to really focus on why we celebrate it's not about the family, although I hope you have a family to go to. It's not about the food. I hope you're well fed. It's not about the gifts, and I hope, but I hope your blessings are many. But it's about Jesus Christ has come for you and for me. That he will bring us salvation. He'll bring justice. He'll bring peace. He'll restore things to the way they should be. And we have so much to be grateful for and thankful for. So set aside some time to reflect on the reason for the holiday. And if you are not yet understanding or you know that you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says today is a day of salvation. That means you have the opportunity today. No one's promised tomorrow. But if you would respond, you have the right to become children of God because of what Jesus has done for you. And I can think of no better Christmas gift than that as well. So I'll close in prayer and then we'll invite us to come up and close in song. But let's celebrate and say thank you, Jesus.